Hey, uh, welcome to Page to Stage. I am Adaye Moon, the Associate Artistic Director at Theatrical Outfit, and I am honored to have the wonderful Amber McGinnis, Director of Tiny Beautiful Things, uh, as, as my guest today. Um, uh, Amber, you know, like the show is beautiful. You did beautiful work. Um, and I know before you were in Atlanta, uh, you were a working artist in the DMV area. <laughs> so <laughs> how is the Atlanta theater scene different than, than DC? Oh, goodness. Well, first off, thank you. I'm like so happy to chat with you about this show and have loved yes. uh, working with you on this process just from casting and then getting your notes uh, through previews and stuff. Um, gosh, it, it's moving to Atlanta. I, I think more than being in a new town, it's like coming out like post pandemic and mm, or yeah. is it really post? I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> not late, really. late pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> um uh and and so I, I think the big thing has just been like trying to just bring everything we've learned as individuals and as a society um in this time that we've had like into into our work and with a play that's all about connection mm -hmm. and how we connect as individuals um how we are compelled to reach um when we feel alone and the ways we work to sort of break down like those barriers whether they were techno technological in the early days of the pandemic or um whatever that means uh like that i think that was sort of the thing that informed things a lot more. And I mean, I, I guess like just to give Atlanta props without like, like I, I love my time in DC and um, I, I, I love so many of the, the theaters there and the artists there are some of my dearest friends, but the wealth of talent here oh, yeah. in Atlanta it's has just it's amazing. blown me away, blown me away. Like I, I don't think Atlanta gets enough credit for the depth of talent that's here. And I think, you know, with, with the thriving film industry, people think about like actors coming in from Hollywood <laughs> or from other places in the country. And like Atlanta just has a depth of talent and not just talent and artistry, but soul mm -hmm. um, in a way that I've not experienced in any other city. So um, that was a thing that I, really just had so much gratitude for especially with this play right. that required artists to just dig deep and have a lot of like sympathy and empathy for their characters um so yeah yeah and, and I mean you you mentioned soul and I mean it's such a beautiful soulful piece uh based on you know these these actual letters that Cheryl Strait you know, received when she was, you know, a, an advice columnist <laughs> and w which makes it, which give us, gives us some interesting challenges for a director. Yeah. So could you talk a little <laughs> bit about those challenges in directing, you know, a piece made up of letters <laughs> yeah. and how you, you came up with some solves from those challenges from a theatrical perspective? Yeah. Well, I, I think w one of the, the, most exciting things that we learned at our first table read um, was that it did not feel like a monologue play because when you read, mm. when you read it, it, you know, it's like someone speaks for a page or two pages right. and then someone right. else speaks. And then you have these tiny epistles sort of sprinkled in, but the bulk of it is these long letters. And the thing we learned in our first read through was that when you bring an ensemble together, the listening becomes such an important part of the story and how how sugar hears these letters what she, what she is gleaning from the the personalities and then what the people are learning from her how they are challenged by her when do they um like the advice that she's giving when does she push too hard all of those things were choices that we had to make. So what was on paper felt like 
you know, a very, um, like I said, monologue piece. It, it didn't feel like that in the, the, in the tackling of it, which right. was really exciting. Um, and, and we worked really hard to kind of, you know, uh, to really be clear about those beats as well. Um, mm -hmm. And to take cues for the letter writers and how they were going to present their their letters based on how sugar responds. Because, you know, there would be a way that sugar, like sugar could respond totally differently if the sort of like attitude of the way a letter was presented changed just slightly, you slightly, know, and that was right. just with Maria being such a talented actor, just responding intuitively and in the moment to what the letter writers were 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 giving her um and so it was really about calibrating that chemistry giving the play variety so that um both vocally and physically there was a lot of nuance given to all of the letter writers because we have three actors playing dozens and dozens of roles so um taking care to sort of keep that diversity of perspectives and presentations like within each of the letters was part of our work um and then also just trying to to craft a journey for sugar mm -hmm. within this piece because she's she's a brilliant writer <laughs> uh, she's her first letter response is like she's already a brilliant writer so she doesn't necessarily have to learn how to become a writer mm -hmm. through the story I think what she learns and what, you know, Maria and I tracked together through the story was just how much of herself was she willing to give and offer and what parts of her own soul and story sort of crack open and with, with how much ease does she sort of come in and out of these moments um, was part of what we crafted in terms of her character arc. Yeah, that felt yeah. like a very long-winded answer. Was that no? But there, no, but it was, it, was a, it was a perfect answer too. And, and you made me think think too about the fact that you know when uh, when people have been asking me about the the play, um, one of the things that 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 I say is that you know I mean especially the time that we're living in and how, how it's so hard for human beings to actually authentically connect, and that this is a play that's so much about not just about empathy but about. Um, but about the, you know this idea of how deep, deep listening can become a path to empathy, um, and that's not something I've been saying to everyone. I'm like, you know, uh, this is a piece that requires you to to listen deeply because the actors on stage are doing that, and yeah. and that's where so much of the beauty and so much of the love and joy in the piece is coming from. Um, for an, an audience person that's coming in fresh, who's like, you know, never read any of Cheryl's books or who hasn't seen the Hulu series yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what would you want them to, to come away with after, after this experience? Well, one thing I'll piggyback on just from what you were just saying is that with our approach with the design, mm. you know, Sh Sugar is inviting these letter writers into into her heart, into her world, and into her home. Her <laughs> so actual we, home. <laughs> we say that in a very literal way with this. Right. And as in the building of the design, it was important to me that it feel like any of these letter writers could be members of our audience. Mm -hmm. And so bringing the actors from the audience space into Cheryl or Sugar's <laughs> living room and then literally having the audience members sit on stage as though they were like seating and sitting in couches that are an extension of sugar's living room. That sort of became, um, it, it, it wasn't just part of our concept and our design aesthetic. It really informed how the letter writers interacted with the audience as well, okay. because we had a conversation early on where, um, you know, for anyone who sees the play, there's a very upsetting <laughs> but beautiful list that is read towards the end. Mm, yes. And none of us could get through the a rehearsal of that scene without crying. 
So Candy and Steven, who aren't, you know, who don't have any lines in that section are on stage listening. Um, and so we had the conversation early on, like, can we respond to this? Mm. Can we cry? Is it okay to cry? Right, and right. The answer was yes. Like in this moment, you are an audience with the rest of us that may be sitting out in the house, mm. but we are, we are showing up and listening to this moment and we are allowed to listen with our hearts open mm -hmm. and and just allow that to happen you know there doesn't have to be a performance there we can just show up as human beings listening to something that's really beautiful and heartfelt and real because it was right. a real letter um and so that I hope I, I think that that exudes from the whole performance just that human quality and the presence of those authentic and real emotions. No, um, and, 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 and it definitely does. Again, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I actually want to respond to that too, because like, you know, again, like, you know, the, the, the immersive element of having those couches on stage uh, and having a, you know, been a person who sat in, in the couch yeah. <laughs> and I'm telling y'all that's, that's a spot to be, <laughs> <laughs> but, but just having it on the stage completely, obliterates the fourth wall for the yeah. rest of the audience who's watching as well so yeah. it's like even though we may not be actually on the stage we are in her living room throughout the entire piece and it's that kind of intimacy that's really um super rare so you know kudos uh on the design and that concept because i think it really works for this piece awesome and, and, and the second part of that question was um what do you want the audience to come away with after they experience this show uh, so whenever I direct something, I feel like I'm always trying to recreate for an audience the thing that I felt the first time I interacted with the work. And so I, I first came to the book, Tiny Beautiful Things before I, you know, before it had ever become a play or a Hulu series. Um, and it was it was so meaningful to me because it it was a, a a tough transition time in my life where I was recently divorced and just asking a lot of the big questions about who I am, who I want to be, um, and also just dealing with a lot of shame around that. Um, and it felt like when I was reading that book that Cheryl's words just sort of like pierced through the darkness that I was living in and I felt seen mm -hmm. and I felt like I could have all of these regrets, but didn't have to be defined by them mm -hmm. and could own my past and own myself and own my history um, in a way that actually empowered me instead of made me live in a place of shame. And I think this play can do that for people. I think it can like, maybe not in that specific way, but I think that if people feel, I'm just going to say that again, because my phone just went off. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I want people to feel seen. Mm -hmm. I want people to feel like, and, and I want people to, to see what it, what can happen when we show up and truly listen. Right and and show up with that radical empathy like i think the world would be such a like it'd be much better place <laughs> so much better we, yeah yeah just uh, like yeah. we because i mean there the play doesn't pretend that we're not all like different it doesn't paint this like rosy perception of our lives if they anything it really shows some of the ugliest parts of our life like right we, we, yeah. we talk about it being a beautiful piece and all this kind of stuff but it's gritty and it has some harsh language in it mm -hmm. and she is real <laughs> like yeah, these no, she's real. Are real real um and i think it can be a both and and that's right. the thing that really excites me about the work and excites me as an artist because that's the type of work I want to be putting out in the world right. forget this or that it's always a yes and um yeah. and 
hopefully audiences walk away feeling just a little more generous or a little more like maybe I could hear this person in a different way uh, or, you know, like mm -hmm. questioning how they can show up for, for other people. And also just that their own struggles are valid and seen and it doesn't make them any easier, but that they don't have to be alone as they sort of go through them or, or process them. Right, so right. there's some big ambitions for play. I mean, it's it's a lot, but 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 I mean, ideally, I I think this this should be the ambitions we have for any any piece of art that we create. Um, yeah, why make and, art unless you why make art? Yeah, unless, unless you know? like beautiful and messy, <laughs> and you know. Uh, but but I I I just want to thank you for your 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 craft and your open heart <laughs> and uh, your just amazing um professionalism and 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 rigor in this whole process um thank you and i think the results of that are evident in your collaboration with the artists involved and the wonderful performances on stage so so thank you for that thank you that means a lot to me i appreciate yeah. that <laughs> and 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 for for you know people watching or, or listening um you know this is a gorgeously messy wonderful show <laughs> uh, I really hope that everybody comes out and sees it uh, Tiny Beautiful Things at Theatrical Outfit we close on April 23rd please come uh, bring your family bring your friends have drinks beforehand and after you'll probably need them <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but please come and be a part of this experience that um, Amber and this wonderful artist helped to craft um, it's a so special Thank you.